It is January the 4th, 2018, and Harry and Eric have come out to video the last facility to be documented in the history of the OC Park system, otherwise known as Smith Cliffs Park. Silent era film stars once rode horseback in the moonlight along a secluded strip of a larger oceanfront property of which Smithcliffs was once a part. During the Roaring Twenties, Florence Poncho Barnes, the legendary cigar-smoking aviatrix, lived here, eventually blowing her fortune, hosting lavish parties for her famous Hollywood guests that included the likes of John Wayne, Ramon Navarro, Eric von Stroheim, Mary Pickford, and others. A portion of the site was later bought by Lon Smith and renamed Smithcliffs a 10.4 acre property that remained a private single family residence estate until 1985. The 10.4 acre estate was ultimately subdivided into 26 custom residential lots and it was covered with well over a hundred major specimen trees and since it was an unincorporated island our offices required the developer to excavate and box all the trees and set them aside, go ahead and do the grading for the 26 foot lot subdivision and then put the trees back into the property uh, and they consisted of Torrey Pines and Canary Island Pines and these magnificent Italian stone pines which are now within this linear park that links Coast Highway to a little secret just beyond. the walkway that we've just traversed, we come to a little pocket park that is established here on the ocean front, looking down into Bootlegger's Cove. And one can imagine the Roaring Twenties during Prohibition when uh, Poncho Barnes and her party uh, guests would receive liquor. Actually, it's known that uh, the liquor was dropped off here at Bootlegger's Cove to, su to supply the whole city of Laguna Beach. The cove is only accessible at low tide but on foot, but people can come in on paddle boards. Crescent Bay Point Park in uh, North Laguna Beach, uh, which was actually established in uh, March of 1975. It was the first park acquisition that occurred after I joined Harbors Beaches and Parks, and it, it was at the behest of the leadership of former Supervisor Ronald Caspers, and then subsequently uh, implemented under Supervisor Thomas Riley with the assistance of uh, his uh, dedicated staff assistant Scott Ferguson who later became um, uh, a member of the staff of the Trust for Public Land and this was an undeveloped promontory known as McKnight's Point and I used to come here and hang out with my buddies when we were kids and it was always uh, 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 under a family trust but eventually in the early 70s they started selling off residential lots to be developed and that uh, mounted some uh, pressure that we might lose this incredible uh, scenic viewpoint uh, that 
gives you a view of almost the entire South County coastline. And so with the assistance of the Trust for Public Land, they stepped in and purchased uh, 2.3 acres of land consisting of three estate residential lots for approximately a million dollars an acre, which was the most expensive per acre cost that the Harbors, Beaches, and Parks system had uh, incurred uh, up to that time. You can see in the distance Crescent Bay and the Twin Points estate owned by the Contino family who have generously hosted many public benefit fundraisers. And in the distance, Laguna Bay and Aliso and Wood Canyons Wilderness Park and Laguna Coast Wilderness Park on the distant ridge lines. have Harbors Beaches and Parks Commissioner James DeMarco from the 3rd District. Uh, Jim, how many years have you been on the Commission? Approximately 10 years. I was appointed in uh, 1995 or 1996 by Supervisor Don Saltarelli. And you've served under several supervisors, haven't you? Yes. Uh, after Saltarelli, uh, Supervisor Spitzer and all subsequent supervisors. Uh, which is a testimony to your effectiveness as a commissioner because rarely do harbor commissioners get reappointed by so many successive supervisors. Jim, what, uh, uh, what, what is a major milestone that's been accomplished at Harbors, Beaches and Parks on your watch? I think the most significant factor was a subject matter brought to us by what I would call activist citizens concerning the condition of the deeds as to some of the park parcels. In fact, those deeds uh, did not have the language required or the language necessary to ensure that the parcels would remain parkland forever. And we were able to obtain uh, the help of the Board of Supervisors and the county uh, staff to change those deeds so that now that property will always remain parkland for future generations. Thanks, Jim. You're welcome. It's March 20th, 2018, the first day of spring, and here we are to document the acquisition history and some important milestones in the life of Aliso Beach County Park, thought to be the most heavily visited of all county-owned beaches. The park consists of nine discrete parcels of land, each acquired separately. First, the area at the south end of Aliso Beach, abutting Camel Point and where the concession building is currently located was acquired by dedication from the Skidmores and others in their 1924 Coast Royale track map number 831. The total dedication on that map was for over nine acres, most of it consisting of Camel Point and West Street beaches. It's thought to be the first, if not one of the first, public beach dedications in the history of the state of California. The area up coast of the Skidmore dedication remained under the control of the Thurston Trust. The Thurstons were the first homesteaders in Laguna and their home was located on what is now the Aliso Creek Golf Course at the ranch at Laguna, formerly Ben Brown's Resort. 
The Skidmores made their private beach available to the public, just like James Irvine II did with his picnic grounds that later became Irvine Regional Park. Then, under the leadership of the Board of Supervisors chairman and, and their colleagues, Willard Smith and Willis H. Warner, on June 22, 1949, the Harbor District had purchased 1.5 acres from Thurston to establish a stronger public foothold on the beach. And then, at the behest of 5th District Supervisor Alton Allen, on April 26, 1961, the Harbors and Beaches District purchased another 0.63 acres from Thurston, which consisted of the old Coast Road, threading its way up around the hill. Quickly followed by the purchase of four parcels totaling 7.73 acres from Roy Shipley on June the 2nd, 1961. More than six years later, the Harbors Beaches and Parks District purchased a whopping 4.2 acres from Shipley to expand the parkland inland of Coast Boulevard. Followed by the final purchase on June 29, 1977 from Terrell of 0.4 acres where the old Aliso Taco stand was located and the park restrooms are currently situated. Another major milestone was construction of the grant funded inland Aliso Beach parking lot and recreation facilities seen here on the land acquired in 1967 and 1977. And linking Aliso Beach County Park to the Coast Royal neighborhood is this very popular remnant of the Old Coast Road that predates the 1926 alignment of the modern South Coast Boulevard. The Old Coast Road right-of-way was purchased in fee from the Thurston Estate in April 1961. It's the last remnant of the Old Coast Road known to exist in all of Orange County. There were many milestones swirling about Aliso Beach County Park. Some of them included construction of the ill-fated Aliso Pier in 1970, thought to be the, if not one of the deepest water piers in California. It was built of reinforced concrete and funded by a grant from the State Department of Fish and Game, now called Fish and Wildlife Department. By the 1980s, the concrete started spalling and salt water got into the structural rebar, causing a kind of bone cancer. We threw a lot of good money after bad money trying to save it, but Mother Nature won out. With 40% of the time the south swells pressuring the pier and 60% of the time swells from the northwest, well, unlike the wooden piers in Orange County, concrete doesn't flex. And so, in the late 1990s, we saw the handwriting on the wall and the Board of Supervisors authorized its demolition. It was a tricky job because the South Orange County Wastewater Management Agency's ocean outfall lays right alongside where the pier was situated and the demolition team had to be very careful to safeguard the outfall. Although Aliso was a unique diamond-shaped pier enjoyed by many, some of whom used to sneak onto the gated pier during giant wave storms and jump off the tip into the abyss, there was a hidden blessing in its demolition. 
The landslide and subaquatic sand surface returned to its original South Pacific like splendor. And the park has been the site of the Victoria Skimboard World Championships for many years since the pier's demolition. There is a special section on Orange County Piers, including Aliso, elsewhere in this history of OC Parks video program. Mother Nature also kept ripping out the southernmost beachfront parking lot. So we gave up and got a grant from the California State Coastal Conservancy to remove it and restore the beach. times to acquire a Liso rock, the giant lug of San Onofre Breccia abutting Aliso Lagoon on the ocean side of Coast Boulevard. But the sellers always demanded more money than the independent appraisals. State law prohibits public agencies from paying more than appraised fair market value, so we didn't have the flexibility to pay the owners as much as they wanted. With the passage of time, Aliso Rock ultimately sold to a private party which carved it out like a pumpkin to build the Rock House. But the county did acquire a scenic easement over the remaining portion of the Rock facing Aliso Lagoon, which, by the way, is soon to become the subject of a proposed lagoon restoration project. When I first joined OC Parks in 1975, the elusive Tidewater Gobi still inhabited the lagoon. The hopes are to entice them back. So there you have it, a rather complicated explanation of just how this popular beach park was established. It's a good example of the strenuous, painstaking, and tedious effort that went into acquiring all 66 facilities documented in this history of OC Parks for both past and future public enjoyment. On July 18th in 1924, the Skidmore family, who actually operated the original Laguna Beach Water Company prior to the establishment of the Laguna Beach County Water District, recorded the Coast Royale tract map. Uh, and in so doing, they dedicated to the county its fourth oldest regional recreation facility, which is called Camel Point and West Street Beaches, together with an extensive series of vertical access ways and park parcels. And in fact, we suspect that the stairway between Coast Boulevard, uh, just south of Camel Point Drive, is the first and oldest dedicated vertical access way in the state of California, still constructed today of native San Onofre Breccia. 
And as you can see, arguably, uh, this is probably, at least in my humble opinion, the most beautiful of all of our regional recreation facilities. With all due respect to magnificent places like Casper's Park and elsewhere, the richly vegetated bluffs, uh, sitting here in the shadow of Aliso Peak, which is the highest peak in the Green Belt, this close to the ocean, just literally a block inland. The beach itself uh, it, uh, consists of approximately 15 acres of land and it is operated as an adjunct uh, to Aliso Beach County Park which is just around the promontory and in the distance out there separating this particular large grand cove from Aliso Beach is Camel Point Rock itself which no longer resembles the humps of a camel but it did years ago before beach erosion wore it away. South Laguna, which had its inception in 1924 with the dedication on the original Coast Royale tract map. And at that time, the county accepted a 15 foot wide easement in which this staircase is now currently uh, located. And we embarked on a program jointly with the California Coastal Conservancy and the California Coastal Commission to uh, improve this access way in the mid 80s and to my knowledge we underwent the longest uh, series of, of uh, sequential lawsuits uh, by uh, people in the neighborhood attempting to prevent us from opening this beach which we uh, acquired in 1924. Uh, construction was completed on the stairway in about 1989. And what you see is about one third of the sandy beach area with the remaining two thirds around the promontory. And in the distance there, you see the famous Eagle Rock for which Eagle Rock Way is named, which was the feeding platform for the last breeding pair of American bald eagles inhabiting Southern California before they left the site in the late 1920s. Steps Beach, which has a very, very interesting history to it because uh, the beach was used by the public for many years by simply walking down the long stairway, which really only at the time had 246 stairs, but it seemed so many stairs that they called it Thousand Steps Beach. And around uh, 1979, the Homeowners Association here in Ninth Avenue Cove, which is in the foreground, as opposed to Paradise Cove, which is the distant cove, uh, hired a guard to uh, discourage the public from uh, using the stairs to the beach. 
um, a great deal of discord ensued and eventually the county embarked on an elaborate program whereby we placed advertisements in all the major metropolitan newspapers of the United States uh, asking anyone who ever used Thousand Steps Beach to please contact us to obtain an affidavit. When the process was done, which was undertaken by our then chief engineer in Harbors, Beaches and Parks, Robert Young, we obtained about 1,800 affidavits uh, from members of the public from all across the United States indicating that they had used the beach as far back as 1905. And with that, we went into court uh, we were already in litigation with the Homeowners Association and I think they saw the handwriting on the wall and they entered into settlement negotiations with us and with the assistance of the State Attorney General's Office, Deputy Attorney General Jamie Jordan Patterson, uh, we commenced negotiations and acquired um, the Sandy Beach area uh, from the mean high tide a considerable distance back um, of dry sand and then obtained a grant from the California Coastal Conservancy and reconstructed the stairway so now it's 241 stairs and um, the uh, beach is, is very popular uh, and in the distance you see Three Arch Bay that's where we're located is just to the north of Three Arch Bay uh, the beach park had its inception then in 1984 when the acquisition process was complete. And now we're at our fifth oldest regional recreation facility, which was actually dedicated on a tract map October 29th, 1926, and it's known as Three Arch Bay County Beach. And it's a very isolated beach in a very pristine environment. We do own a vertical access way that leads to it. There are no pedestrian rights over the streets of the private community of Three Arch Bay, so the only legal way that the public can come to the facility is to park at Salt Creek Beach Park in the distance over near the Ritz-Carlton Hotel, and then to traverse along the shoreline uh, the public tidelands uh, beaches in front of Monarch Bay and then work their way over into this isolated and pristine cove. You can tell from the film here that it is uh, extraordinarily well preserved. In fact, Three Arch Bay County Beach is thought to be the the uh, last of the original untouched beaches left in Orange County, uh, showing very little sign of um, of, uh, of wear uh, by virtue of light public attendance. We're actually witnessing some dolphins playing in the water because this is a, a little out of the way uh, cove protected by the elements that allows uh, abundant marine life to uh, come in here and feed whales uh, and dolphins and all forms of sea life. There are even some uh, intact reefs offshore. out 
across the north end of Salt Creek Beach Park. And in the distance, up at that promontory, is where the county's Three Arch Bay Beach is located. And that's the way from this location is how you, the public can get there. This is a real interesting facility because when the California Coastal Protection Act was on the ballot many years ago, the AVCO community developers, who were the successors to the Laguna Niguel Corporation, saw the handwriting on the wall and realized that it was most likely going to be approved by the voters. So what they did was they started mass grading the entire then Laguna Niguel area, which is now within the city of Dana Point, and set up huge Clegg lights and graded around the clock uh, just D9s running willy-nilly all over the place. That activity got such bad publicity that what ultimately happened was that a majority of the voters in all 58 California counties voted in favor of the California Coastal Protection Act. And so Salt Creek Beach Park isn't just one of the world's surfing hotspots, it played a huge role in promoting statewide coastal protection. People come from all around the world to surf at Salt Creek Beach Park, from Australia, Tahiti, New Zealand, Europe. It's a very, very popular surfing hotspot worldwide. And as we look down in this large grass area in the foreground, um, I should note that the park had uh, 33.8 acres as of 1972. And how that came about was that uh, when the Coastal Act passed, the uh, APCO community developers uh, uh, management was incentivized to come to the table to negotiate with county staff culminating in a purchase agreement where Harbors, Beaches and Parks paid AVCO somewhere around two million dollars for the land and to construct the parking lots and access facilities. And then further enhancements were done uh, here in terms of restroom facilities and concession stand uh, by county staff under the leadership of Ken Sampson to begin with then Larry Lehman and Ralph Hudson. And then um, in 1987, as the Monarch Beach community was starting to develop, we obtained a 7.6 acre addition to the park from Stein Brief Group, who was the successors to the Avco community developers, and created this beautiful uh, bluff top park, grassy field, for people to play basketball, and there's even a giant chess set down there, and picnicking and shade structures and so forth. And when the uh, Ritz-Carlton originally came forth with its proposal to build the Ritz-Carlton Hotel, the county required them to install these public access facilities to better link the hotel with uh, the beach and in fact there's even a public pedestrian easement that comes right through the lobby of the hotel and out the back door to get here and they installed some sculpture up at that gazebo in the distance which I believe is a whale And there was very extensive prolonged litigation here on the Avco property in Laguna Niguel in order to get Salt Creek Beach County Park established. And uh, that was almost exclusively funded by a single individual, the first woman city council member in Laguna Beach, Helen Keeley, put up the money and hired the prominent environmental attorney, William Wilcoxon, to litigate 
and sue the AVCO community developers to bring them to the negotiating table. That's what set the stage for the Harbors, Beaches and Parks staff to step in and be the good guys and sit down with them at the table and to negotiate a purchase agreement for the improvements that I described earlier. And it was William Wilcoxon who also helped in other areas because he was the attorney for the Capistrano Beach Park and Recreation District and in an earlier effort to make Pines Bluff Park go away across the Coast Highway from uh, Capistrano Beach Park, it was Wilcoxon who took that all the way to the State Supreme Court who unanimously ruled the perpetuity and the intention of the original dedication by the Doheny family for Pines Bluff Park. Here we're at Sea Terrace Community Park at Niguel Road and Coast Highway in Dana Point. It's about 22 acres of Ocean View property fronting on Coast Highway. At the time the land was dedicated in 1992 by Stein Brief Group, we figured it was worth about $3 million an acre or a total of $60 million. Now the point here is that very valuable durable recreation assets have been established for the public in perpetuity both in terms of dollar value but also the value of mental and physical well-being. Here we are at the underpass of Coast Highway that connects Salt Creek Beach County Park with Sea Terrace Community Park, which demonstrates the integral relationship that we formulated by trying to link regional and community facilities. While we're standing in the Rose Garden of Sea Terrace Community Park, I wanted to mention that like Salt Creek Beach Park, even Laguna Niguel Regional Park, Crown Valley Community Park, Chaparosa Community Park, and Colinas Bluffs Open Space, Sea Terrace Park was originally embedded in the 1970 County Service Area No. 3 Master Plan of Local Parks and Recreation that was originally prepared by Lent Forsum Associates, namely my lifetime friend Tony Grasso, for the Laguna Niguel Corporation. We kept updating the master plan for local parks and recreation for county service area number three, which at the time was Laguna Niguel's sphere of influence. But later, the area became part of Dana Point. And we updated the master plans for all the other unincorporated communities to keep ahead of rapid development. And we used these board approved documents to negotiate, extract, the local and community parks and trails and open space from the developers. During the 1980s and the 1990s, there was a huge political uproar that emerged in Los Angeles County because a number of very well-established golf courses were being converted to intensified development for residential and commercial purposes. In order to assure the preservation of the open space in golf courses in Orange County from that time forward, and since the development counted their golf course acreage as part of their overall open space requirement for their proposed planned communities. The county imposed a requirement whereby the developers dedicated a golf course scenic easement over their golf courses. For example, at Pelican Hills on Newport Coast, the Monarch Beach Golf Course in Dana Point, Tierras Creek Golf Course in Santa Margarita and others to assure the 
preservation of that open space in perpetuity in order to comply with the requirements of the California Environmental Quality Act. This program is among the efforts recognized in the Lifetime Achievement Award from the President of the United States in 2015. Supplemental information on the history of the Orange County Park System is included in the California State University Fullerton Center for Oral and Public History. Interview number 2061 of Eric Jessen by Joanna Brand, published in 2008.